Hey, Revolutionaries, I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Jordan Carroll, the remote job coach. And yes, we are talking remote jobs. And I can't think of another topic that's more important than, than remote jobs right now. So super excited for you guys to listen to it. And, you know, he shares his top, you know, key characteristic that he thinks is most important in getting a remote job and keeping a remote job. So it's great to hear his voice on that topic. And, you know, we talk about basketball and what he's doing in Mexico. So how he's... Uh, um, dealing with the lockdown situation in Mexico, being a foreign, being in a foreign country, you know, um, he's a U.S. citizen. It's a really interesting episode. Really looking forward for you guys to check it out. But before we get there, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been sh- sharing Marie Phil's episode, episode sixty-six, the previous episode I just released. So I think everybody uh, got a lot out of it and was excited about that that one. And just wanted to remind everyone to keep sharing. You know, share with your friends and family, the people that you really think need to hear these messages, because I think everyone's realizing right now, like, hmm, yeah, this is a, this is longer than a few weeks. Everybody's starting to go stir crazy, and we need this real endurance mindset. We're going to get through it, and it's going to be just another set of challenges when things start to open up again as to, you know, am I going to go out? How do I be safe when I go out? You know, maybe I better order some masks for myself if I haven't had any. That might be a requirement in many places to just go in, you know, any restaurants and bars, for example, going forward for a time. But uh, anyways, another challenge to to everyone's mindset. And if you are of the mindset now, uh, at least in terms of work, that you're not that interested in going back out uh, and mixing with the public, for example, if that was the nature of your job and, and right now you can't do your job remotely, Maybe you want to think about a remote job going forward, at least in the short term here. And Jordan, Jordan Carroll is the man that can help you move in this direction. So let's get to the episode. This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast is brought to you by MG Schlachter, a built environment and architectural consulting firm with an in-house production team. Delivering support services in the retail, hospitality, and residential sectors for leading brands worldwide, MG Schlachter is reinventing something near and dear to my heart, of course, architectural support services. Suffice it to say that whatever built environment or architectural project you're working on, MG Schlachter can step in and help accelerate your growth. So if you're looking for a built environment and architectural services firm with an in-house production team to help you reinvent your next project, check out MG Schlachter Find them on the web at mgschlachter.com. That's M-G-S-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R.com, mgschlachter.com. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit JimJimsReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, this is Jim Jim. Welcome to episode 67 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm talking today with Jordan Carroll, the remote job coach, and we're talking remote jobs. So Jordan, welcome to the Reinvention Revolution. Jim, thanks for having me, man. I'm still at where we met, which I'm sure you uh, probably miss right now. Oh, I man, you took the words right out of my mouth, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was thinking about it, you know, I'm, I'm back in the States. So after, so we met, first of all, I'll explain this to everybody who's listening out there. <laughs> so we met at the Nomad Summit this past October in, uh, uh, it was in Cancun, and then we, you know, hung out later in Playa del Carmen. We got to know each other a little bit more down in Playa, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, since then, so I had you know, come back like in the fall, and then I went to Asia uh, during the winter. So I was in Asia end of January, and I got back about March 5th. So I was there when all this crazy, you know, pandemic started really ramping up and getting a little bit dicey. So I I actually kind of made my way back during a good window where before flights got shut down, before the country started locking up their borders and everything. Um but since then, I've been locked down and been thinking, like, gosh, when am I ever going to travel again? <laughs> so I'm back in all, yeah. right, back in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, right now. Um, but yeah, thinking about talking to you today, I was like, oh man, he's still down in Playa. That's got to be really cool. Although, maybe you can tell me is how does it feel to you down there 
being there during this pandemic and you know you're not you know from Mexico you're from the states and why did you decide to to stay there or not come home you know yeah no i think it's great call out because being an expatriate in a country that you know you're not from and right. going through this pandemic situation is a very weird because on my side of things i think about what it's like to be in the States. I obviously have a lot of friends that live there. My family lives there. So I get all this secondhand information mm -hmm. of what it's like to be there. And when I'm hearing what they were describing, Mexico has been far behind the curve, both in reactions and both in infections. Mm. They're still not really testing either. I think they've tested a few thousand people out of however many millions of their population there is. Wow. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> yeah. they have a very uh, misconstrued, um, I'll just say this. Yeah, Mexico government has done a terrible job reacting to this. And I had thought for a while it was it was like uncomfortable for me to feel like I could be critical of the Mexican government. Um, right. But here's here's where I, I took that shift was that um, the way that that their president is is handling this and actually putting a lot of Mexican lives at risk. I think it, it is valuable to bring as much attention to it as, as you can because nothing change if nobody nothing changes if nobody knows about it. So I right. think a lot of the world may not even understand what's happening in Mexico, but you know, just as as recent as a couple weeks ago, the the president wasn't even advocating for social distancing. He was calling it uh, a kind of a hoax. He had brought out like a four leaf clover and uh wow really okay two dollar bill and he had held it up and said these are my my uh you know here's what's going to stop the coronavirus basically holding it up as a symbol of like religious uh stature and, and saying that that would save him from the coronavirus and then it wasn't really that real they've hmm. been misdiagnosing they haven't been testing so it's been really weird just this just last week they closed the beaches and now they're advocating for um and this is when this is being recorded, this is April 15th, 2020. Right. And this is last week. Wow. Okay. They start, they actually closed things. So, Yikes. yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> so, how are you feeling? Are you, do you, do you feel safe or you feel like this is awkward or what, you know? Yeah, I feel, I feel safe in, in Playa. Uh, I think, you know, it's a more touristy town. Mm -hmm. They ha they do have infrastructure that is meant for tourism. So there's really not a lot of people here that aren't involved in tourism. And since the tourism is now effectively not happening, right. either it just seems like a lot of people have either left or they did not live here anyway. You know, any of the, the a lot of the Mexican nationals probably were commuting into right. Playa del Carmen sure. because it is a more expensive area out of, um, uh, out of as far as Mexico is concerned. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> as I walk around, you know, there's still a, a pretty hefty police presence. I think they're a bit worried that there's going to be some something that happens. I, there is still a chip on my shoulder knowing that I'm uh, an American that's that's here right now. That just need, I need to be uh, aware yeah. of everything that's going on around yeah, me. Just you, know, you just don't want to become a target. So yeah. that for me is, is is okay for right now. And and now that they're enacting some of these more serious restrictions i think we'll see over the next couple of weeks what happens i see okay yeah I, I guess i would keep an eye on the uh the healthcare system you know that's you know that's obviously the the, mm -hmm. the danger of overwhelming the healthcare system and not being able to get treatment if you need it so um i would start there and not pay attention to the news media so much i guess you know <laughs> um yeah but yeah you know that's interesting uh, thanks for sharing because i hadn't heard that you know I'm in the States. We really haven't heard a lot about what's going on in Mexico, even though it's just right across the border there. You know, we hear more about what's going on in Europe or back in Asia or whatever. So that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's been about a month since we've basically been at, at stay at home here. So like around the 13th, Mar yeah. March 13th, I think they, at least here in Ohio, they said, hey, everybody, you got to stay at home. So it's been, I didn't even think about it. Wow, it's already been a month. Pretty interesting. Well, and I, I more so took direction from the U S for my personal mm -hmm. safety. Like, like I, I've been, I, you know, I've been mostly self-isolated for about a month as well. So right, right. it's just a matter of, but, but it, it, you know, no matter how much you do that, if the rest of the society isn't doing that, there's an issue still. Right. Well, yeah, we're, we're all in it together. Well, hopefully things will, um, stay somewhat mellow. Maybe the temperature, the hot temperatures there maybe help a little bit in terms of just tamping down the spread as quickly. I think that was the case in Asia, although now it's kind of, you know, 
everybody's um, there's there's more cases there, at least in Thailand and, and uh, Philippines where I was. Um, yeah, interesting. Well, s- speaking about this kind of um, American tip, one of the uh, questions I had for you before we dig into the remote job stuff is was about basketball. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking yeah. about you and I was checking out your stuff online, and uh, I remember. Um, uh, that you were a Celtics fan, and it got me thinking mm-hmm. about the NBA. And so I actually went and checked out today, and like you said, it's April 15th, tax day here, uh, about what's going on with the NBA because this is like when the playoffs start. Like late in April is usually like the start of the NBA playoffs, and I'm thinking like, you know, I've been out, so out of it the last few weeks not worrying about sports and all those things that I kind of forgot about it. And like I, I love watching the NBA, so I was just checking in on them to see like, are they even having the season or what's going on with them? And they said that they're not making any decisions until uh, May 1st. So right now, obviously, they're not playing, and they might announce something May 1st. But how how are you thinking about? Are you missing basket? Are you missing basketball? Or <laughs> like? Oh yeah, you know, like are you fucking kidding me, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm missing. Okay, so I had a conversation about this with my friends the other day as well because I feel like I, you know, I broke up with a girlfriend or something because. Right. Not only did I enjoy watching pretty much, every, I watched that pretty much every Celtics game that they played. You know, I'd, I'd stream the games online, but not only that, but they shut down the basketball court here. And I would play. I was playing basketball four times a week, and I played in in a league. I played in a Mexican basketball league here, so I had a team. You know, we were uh, having a lot of fun playing every Tuesdays. I got invited to play on another team. I, you know, right, the right. funny the funny thing is That's is cool. that there's a very low standard for uh, for <laughs> for being <laughs> for good at basketball, basketball yeah. and being invited to teams because right, right. I you know I'm not I'm not great by any means, but right. um, to have that much attention to to come be asked to play for multiple teams, I was like, oh wow, this right, is great. Right, right, right. Um, so I'm more missing the culture of basketball, not only just watching it, but being able to play it. I mean, it's such a for me, it's such a fun game, and I think this is the parallel here is for. For anybody who is doing any sort of competitive um, uh, sports games or or anything that was a creative outlet, you know that that you can't do now because of this, you know the the, the state of the world, the quarantine, all that stuff. It's huge. Like it's yeah. a huge depressant. I mean, it's 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 a big reason why there are so many people who are feeling like shit right now is because they don't have those creative outlets that they have had for so long, and it's almost like we we we'd kind of take it for granted. Well, yeah, oh, it's like yeah, certainly. I mean, it's sort of like you know, it works in a lot of levels. It works for your physical fitness, but it's also like a, a kind of like a counseling session. It's where you kind of just get your head straight. I mean, there's a lot of benefits just just to being involved mm-hmm. in an activity like that, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it's yeah for me the endorphins, the the fitness, the camaraderie, the socialization, right? I mean, everything. I mean, it's it, it was a whole new world to me too because. I, you know, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I'm conversational at best. But mm-hmm. when you go on the basketball court, it's it's a whole different language. It's yeah, because like, it's all slang and it's all like. Oh, you know, interesting! Right? Yeah. Very tech technical terms for basketball that they're using that are still borderline slang in some situations. So you, a lot of times, I you know you have to figure out what people are saying, what people are talking about, and it's right. it's very interesting to be on a team where you're the only. Um, person who doesn't speak the language <laughs> and you're <laughs> right. just like trying to figure out they're, they're like trying to you know tell me what to do uh like right. running, like not like running plays or anything but you know in yeah, timeouts you, get, you stuff, gotta we're like trying to right. go over right. yeah we're trying to go over like the game plan and it's like uh no entiendo yeah uh, i don't understand like <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's probably a good way to connect though too so like you know like that's a, like i love sports i do a lot of sports myself uh, but one of the things I do is is music. So I play music, I play saxophone, and playing in bands and all that kind of stuff. So the same thing, very impactful. There's no gigs. You can't go out to a club and mm-hmm. play with your friends and, and experience the audience and do all that stuff. Uh, but it's also a great way to connect in a different way socially. So when you drop into a different situation, like living in Playa, you know, it's foreign, it's not where you're from or whatever, you get to have this yeah. camaraderie with a bunch of other, like, real local people, like an insight that you would get that maybe the average person – even though they moved there that didn't have an activity like that wouldn't see or wouldn't get as connected so it's yeah it's it's a it's a big void right now for everybody <laughs> those kind of kind of things 100 percent. yeah and yeah like you that i think that's a great point you effectively 
if there's any way to become a local, it's to do something that locals are doing. Right. So for me, that's, you know, I know a lot of people, even if they wanted to play basketball, would walk by a basketball court in a different country where they don't speak the language and probably not feel comfortable. Right. For me, that has been like, as I've traveled as a nomad and, and been to, you know, 15 countries in two years, Mm -hmm. the one thing that was the most important for me in every place that I went was finding that pocket of community on the basketball court. I brought my shoes wherever I could. I, at one point I was carrying a ball with me for four months and then, you know, in, in any place other otherwise where I didn't have a ball, I would go and try and find a court. Oh, and right. that was just such a fun way to connect with people be, and, and actually feel like you're, you're part of it. Right. Um, so, so that is an interesting, yeah, it's a good icebreaker. And I do the same thing. I bring my horn wherever I go. And it's like, I'll find a jam or just go out and play outside. And then people will say like, oh, I see you play music. And it's just, you know, they, it's just a way to op- open up the a new country, a new place in a different way. You know, mm-hmm. it's cool. Yeah, neat, man. Well, all right. So let's, let's uh, thank, and thanks for sharing that, by the way, because I, I just, I, w- I just saw you, I think I saw some, you posting something about playing basketball down there. And I'm like, oh, that's mm-hmm. cool. Cause I, cause I played basketball in high school. I've, I've always played like since college and stuff like that. I'm like, that'd be, that'd be a total fun way to get to know a different location you know but um anyways let's let's dig into the to, to the remote job stuff so how did you tell me about this remote job coaching thing that you're doing and how you and why that you you know decided to kind of end up in playa or decided to be this digital nomad sure yeah i mean i've been working remote since 2014 so uh my first job out of college was with a really big corporation fortune 50 um, eventually worked remotely for them starting in 2014. When I moved on from them after four years, I worked fully remotely for a PR firm, had my own businesses, and then I ended up wanting to travel the world, quit the the PR job, got another job that was remote um, as a salesperson, and then I uh, quit that job down the line and then ended up getting another job with uh, Remote Year as okay. a uh, remote salesperson as well. And between all that time, I was also coaching as a side business because I'd realized I really enjoy being an educator and being someone who helps others in um, through like through education and enablement. Like I, I have a, a special way of, of being able to do that for people. I see. So not necessarily remote job coaching, but just coaching in general. Or how did you how did you start coaching, or why were you drawn to it? Men- mentorship. So okay. I, I was drawn to it through my first job. I would go back to my al- my alma mater mm-hmm. and I would recruit there for my for my business for IBM for the so, company. Yeah, that was oh, okay. the company I worked for. Gotcha. So I worked for IBM, and I had I had developed a partnership between that school and IBM. Mm-hmm. So we had a, a training program that I went through. I was the first person from my college to go through that training program at IBM. So I built. Uh, a link between IBM and the school so that they would continue to recruit there. Sure, and then every okay. time that I would go back, I would lect- I'd lecture on the campus or uh, I'd go to the career fair and I'd, re- I'd um, take resumes. And, you know, I, I just stayed very in contact with the College of Business there because they gave so much to me. Mm-hmm. And if I'm being honest, like the self-serving part of it was I really enjoyed going back there and partying. Like it was just a really <laughs> okay, fun right. time. Oh, so if there was any way for me to keep that contact there and be able to go back and I, you know, I really enjoyed mm-hmm. seeing the the new kids. I enjoyed being part of the the sales program there because they had a big sales competition that I was a part of when I was there. I see. Okay. But I, I, in the deeper, what I realized there was like a deeper contribution for me beyond all the egotistical stuff and beyond just going back to, to party. But like there actually was a wow, like, I feel a sense of contribution when I can get up in front of class and I can I can teach them these concepts or I can make this distinction for somebody that makes them think about this thing a little bit differently. And that eventually evolved to where it is today, rem- to the remote job side. But I've always been, for as long as I remember, I've always been a mentor. I've been an educator. I've been mm-hmm. someone who enjoys enabling other people to grasp information. I see. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I could see how that you know, it's super powerful when you understand that's like, hey, this is an impact. You know, you're helping someone, but it also gives you such a good feeling in return. It's like a real resonant thing that's happening. You know, that's really, really cool. Okay, so I could see. All right, I see how you kind of got into coaching. Did you 
take this thing on in terms of you know going as far as like uh, you know getting certified or kind of like fleshing that out for yourself, or you just do it more like on this um, sort of just kind of like minded basis or whatever with people. Yeah, that's a, well. First of all, it's a great question, and I think a lot of coaches and people that want to be coaches ask themselves the same thing. The short answer is no. I did not get certified okay. in anything, yep. and I think it's it's. Uh, I think not that's, not totally that that's a okay. requirement. I'm just curious yeah, as, yeah, yeah. As kind of how, you, tell how you, you think about it, you know? Yeah. And I want to tell you my, my exact thought process because I think it's such a valid question. And in, in the coaching industry, it's, it is a very weird, like what qualifies you to be a coach, right? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know if there is any like true answer to that. Right. I think when they tried to, when they created all these certifications, you know, they want pe- people felt like they needed something to, justify their ability to be mm-hmm. a coach it, mm-hmm. here's here's what gives you validity as the coach is that you create transformation and you are able to create transformation for your clients and you're able to articulate that the other side of this is like the business side of it like right. i'm a good marketer i i think i am in some ways i have a lot to learn mm-hmm. but my brain and my background is all in marketing and sales mm-hmm so I think I'm actually a better, I was starting out, I was a better marketer and salesperson than I was a coach. And now I think there's parity between the two where it's completely aligned. Like I'm a really good coach and I'm also a good salesperson, good marketer. And I think a lot of that comes from getting coaches myself because I've had a number of coaches, probably, you know, I don't over over ten. Oh, really? Okay. That I've worked with personally, mm-hmm. and I take things from each of them. You know, like their their style, their types of questions, their mindset. You know, and, and you you meet those people in your life that really create the transformation for you, mm-hmm. and then you find out how does that apply to how I create transformation for my clients, and that's how I've eventually become um, a coach at, at the level that I'm at. I see. Very interesting. Okay, so what was your, when you first decided to work with a coach, how did that happen? And what was your mindset back then? Like, why was that interesting to you? And why did you, like, I get once you figure it out, and once you Mm -hmm. see value in it, you might keep going back and back and back. But doing it the first time is always kind of like, huh? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a leap leap of faith or something, I think, you know, it, it has to be. It definitely has to be, but I think it helps to be in a position where you literally have no other options or you failed at everything else. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> maybe so you're at I, rock bottom, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. It was, it was, well, so let me, I can say my first like business coach, I think was back in 2000. Uh, my, 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 the first coach that I invested on, uh, like their one, like their program where I would meet with them each week and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. was, was in 2018, I believe. I see. Um, but I had taken like other courses and things before that. And I'd had other mentors, but this was the first one that was focused on business that I was like, okay, like this, I need to figure out the business of this. Mm-hmm. And I had seen him on LinkedIn. He posted a lot I'd bought in like one of his eBooks or something before. And, you know, he was a very outlandish guy who just had a lot of interesting ideas, really vibrant personal brand, but Mm -hmm. seemed like he was making a lot of money. He knew what he was doing. And I was at that point so confused and so lost with what my next move was. And I I had been sitting in that place for a while and it actually felt, it just felt so good to invest in something. Because then I I knew that at least it wasn't all on me anymore. I didn't feel alone anymore. And I think that that's what I want people to think of when they're considering making an investment is like, it's not ever about the money. It's about the associations of what, like what happens if you don't do something, because there's going to be money involved at some way, like either you're going to be wasting time over the long term, which is essentially wasting money, or you're going to make mistakes that cost money right. down the line. So if you don't do anything to change your situation or, or invest in someone who can help you get there, you're still on the hook. And that's what a lot of people don't think of is like, what's that long-term value of that suffering versus trying to get some help right now? Right. You know, oh, wow. I really like the way you describe that because, um, and this is something that I've, you know, I've grown my mindset over the over the last, you know, I guess four or five years now of of really thinking about, 
how to invest in myself and what that really means. So like, to, you know, to me, my gut, my kind of near kind of gut reaction when I know, when I know something needs to change, I'm thinking like, well, maybe I need, maybe I need to take a course. Maybe I need to, you know, just work harder. Maybe I need to do something a little bit different. You know, I, I kind of look at myself first rather than thinking about, um, you know, reaching out and, you know, spending a lot of money and really investing in myself. Like, like travel, for example, the last few years, I've spent a ton of money on travel. And previously, my mindset would have been to think, that's ridiculous, what are you doing? But now I realize it's such an investment in myself, mm -hmm. and I get so much out of it, and, and it's so uh, informative and cathartic, and it gives me so much joy that when I go back to my normal life, I'm, I'm like, I'm just fired up. And it's not something that you can figure out until you kind of have that leap of faith, like you're saying. And once once you do, it's sort of like, ah, there's there's the world's out there to help you. <laughs> you know, there's other things yeah. out there that can help you. And so that's that's pretty interesting in terms of just hearing your experience of how you you know kind of realize the value of coaching or reaching out to someone like that. Because I think some people might think like, ah, oh, it's a lot of money to pay, or I'm not sure. But there's that there's that trade off you know, that opportunity cost that you're missing. Like you said, you don't necessarily focus on that. It, it often, it often costs more to not know. Yes. To be emotionally yes. stressed, to be frustrated, to not show up for your family, to be in a position where you um, are constantly questioning your decisions, to not have any feedback loops, to not have anybody to talk to. There's so many reasons why it's going to cost you money anyway that has to be taken into uh, the equation. And I understand when people have never invested in coaching, why they, they think of it as a peer, um, you know, uh, cost type of um, relationship. But, right, right. You, you know, and you, you may make a mistake. You may pick the wrong coach. You may, you may not fully invest in yourself. You may go through times where uh, an investment that you, you know, you don't get what you thought you were going to get out of it. And right. I think that that's okay. I think you learn from all those situations. And even if you have sunk money into something that didn't work, I don't view that as, uh, I mean, you just paid for that lesson. That's all that was. That's it's right. It's not like yeah. you lost a bunch of money on consumer debt where you're just buying clothes. It's that's like right. you purchased the, the lesson. Right. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Well, okay. So, so let me let me think about this now. So you're this remote job coach. So tell me about if someone's interested in changing jobs, and now the, so that we're all under this lockdown state of affairs, obviously working remotely is a much uh, bigger interest in the world these days, right? Mm -hmm. And there are skills that we need to develop probably no matter what of how to just work online and work remotely anyways, whether you're an employee or an entrepreneur. But now there's probably more people thinking that they would never want to work remote, that maybe they're forced to work remote, or they're thinking, you know what, maybe I need to pivot because I'm a, I'm a server and my industry might just not come back if I live in a tourist location for a while and I need to do something different in the meantime. How, how do you help people and how do you help companies or do you help companies as well figure this whole remote equation out? What do you do? Yeah, well, simple answer to your question is yes, I do help both individuals and organizations. On the organizational side, it's more about partnering with other consultancies and agencies who actually deliver those things. But okay. um, I do have a hand in the recruitment of different remote individuals as well as formation of remote policies and things like that. So, um, But I'm way more focused on the individual side of the things because that's just where my, my coaching business has come from. That's where my, my main experience is. If mm -hmm. you ask me if I've run a, you know, a hundred person remote company uh, across 11 time zones, the answer is no, you know, I've run my own pretty much solopreneur business mm -hmm. along with, you know, freelancers and, and people that I contract with. And I've had multiple remote jobs. So my experience is more in how do I differentiate myself, articulate my value and get a job with a fully remote or, you know, at least partially remote organization. And, and how do I navigate that world? So I've done that across four or five different industries mm, okay. and all, you know, various different ways that I, I got those jobs. And the interesting part of it was that none, none of those, on, on none of those occasions did I do kind of the, the quote unquote traditional application process. 
meaning where someone is applying online and waiting for that response back. Mm -hmm. Every single one of those times I had some sort of connection to those companies that I had built through networking and, and built through very strategic relationships. And what I teach is a system for people to understand how they can also do that. Um, even if they haven't worked remotely before. However, there is caveats to this. The caveats are remote work is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, another caveat is that you are not entitled to a remote job just because you need one. <laughs> right. I think the, the skills still have to be there. You still have to be someone who, who has transferable skills within these skill sets to work online, to work on a computer, like, like, obviously, the more leverage you have, the more experience you have, the easier this is going to be. I'm not saying that it's impossible for someone who's been a lifelong server, for instance, right. who's never worked online before. Right. But damn, that's going to be hell of a difficult thing. You know, like, you're going to need to completely reinvest in a different skill set first before it even makes sense. Because if you just start applying to a bunch of jobs, like, no one's going to take you seriously and you're just going to be even more frustrated. Right, right. Well, well so... Maybe you can kind of, you know, just rattle off a couple of like the top skills that you think, you know, maybe a, that apply across the board that you really need to have to work remotely. So, I mean, this is something that's interesting to me because I, I feel like, you know, the this this reinvention of the world is happening, like right kind of just right in front of us with all these new technologies, the new conferencing. I mean, think about before this pandemic, I don't think you would ever have thought about, hey, I'm going to have, uh, you know, holidays on a zoom call this weekend with my family. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, 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 and grandma doesn't know what you're talking about and the kids may not have experienced this and, and you might've done it once at your job, uh, yeah. you know, in one meeting or something, but you didn't even know how to figure it, figure it up. And I'll just, this is common. So what are other skills out there that you need to kind of know or understand? The number one skill by far is, is copywriting. Like being able to write in a virtual world mm -hmm. is so paramount to success. And as much as we're going to, we try to create higher bandwidth forms of communication, whether that be through voice, like us talking on the phone right now, right. or through video, you know, doing a, a video call, for instance, there is still a, a, an element of virtual work that will always be dependent on writing and your ability to clearly communicate your thoughts through writing. Because if someone doesn't understand what you're saying because what you're writing is not clear, mm -hmm. it's going to cause a problem in every single line of your ability to work anywhere. If you can't write and communicate, you can't be in a customer service position. If you can't write and communicate to your internal folks, you can't be in an internal position. Like it, Writing is so essential uh, to, to remote work that I think it's the number one greatest skill. Like if you have, if you give me someone who, for instance, is an author and you, and they have no other experience other than like writing greeting cards, or poetry, whatever, mm -hmm. I would, that person is 10 times more likely to be successful at like a remote tech job than really? someone who's like a construction worker or something. Oh, I, that's just interesting. Because okay. I just think the skill of writing, if you've developed a skill of writing and you are able to communicate with other people, like communication is the biggest thing. In, in a lack of personal communication, when you're in front of somebody, in, in the lack of that, how you communicate virtually will be the most important skill that you, you are able to develop. I see. You know what? Wow. You know, that's not something I would have thought about Im immediately off the top of my head, but when I hear you describing it, I think it's right on because th I think that's what this internet and the technologies have given us. It's like this, we're in this connection economy now. We're all connected. And so since the barriers of entry have, a lot, in a lot of ways, have gone away, mm -hmm. what allows you to stand out now is your communication ability, yep. right? Versus, well, you have to come my way because I'm the gatekeeper and I don't have to communicate that that well because... You got to come through my joint, you know, right? But now it's all open <laughs> and we're all like, we're all kind of hot. It's like a kind of level playing field. That's pretty interesting. I, I really like that. I really like that take. And you know what? Maybe I, maybe I knew that gut feeling wise where I needed, I felt like I needed to dive into the 
online digital world more to learn the skills like podcasting, like how to communicate, how to do more of the digital marketing. And I didn't, I wasn't really thinking about it as they're just really communication skills. But uh, now I'm thinking I need to start a blog (laughs) 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 to work on my writing. I'm like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Dude, when you, when you were able to, to, I mean, writing is just practice. It's just over and over and over and over. And there's a lot of people in this world who don't write. Yeah. enough they don't they don't take the time to write every day and it's something that i've been doing for years is that's, writing every day that's in some in, way that's interesting okay all right so here's here's a couple of things so i'm like my background is in technology and engineering so i've never mm-hmm. really been into writing that much because it's i'm more of a math and science guy music and stuff um that's that's really interesting like so so i'm, I'm gonna have to work on that skill a little bit i think <laughs> coming out of this conversation well, and I, I tell you what my dad my dad also engineer background. I can tell it's so distinct. I can tell when he sends me an email and I look at the email, I look how it's formatted. I look at the words choices that he uses. I look at the tense. I look at direct, uh, like active language versus passive language. All of it is turn around because he's <laughs> never had, well, I mean, he's, he's not, I mean, it's not like he, he's not communicating. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's clear what he's saying, right? but, he says it in about 800 more words than I'm saying it, that I, that I could say it, for instance. I see. So just think about that. If, you, right, if it right. takes you 500 to 800 more words to say something, <laughs> you're wasting your time. You're also making it harder for the other person to understand what you're saying right. because you're clouding it with more words, more fluff. Right. And, and the more concise you can be, the more clear you can be in the shortest amount of words, the better remote communicator you're going to be. Think about it like I get... I'll give you another example. I, I'm online on LinkedIn. I will get messages every day. I get mm-hmm. random messages from guys from India, for instance. I got one literally within the past 24 hours of a guy who's looking for a potential job. Mistakes in his spelling completely, uh, basically butchers an entire paragraph right. about like what he thinks I do and giving me his resume and like all these things. Mm-hmm. Because of that, he has ruined forever his impression with me, and I will never answer him. <laughs> right. And this is right. this is the same thing that applies to anybody who does not write well or does not consider empathy within the speech that they use when they're sending a message and how it could be decoded, and then sending a message to like a hiring manager, for instance, or a potential uh, person that they want to network with, right. like down to the very letter it is important what you write right. it's so important so that's i'm gonna get off my soapbox okay but. i love I lo- well I lo- <laughs> that's great man i love it because i didn't I, I i love hearing these nuances of what's really important you know that's that's why i'm doing the podcast i i, I feel like i need to reinvent myself continue to do that now in, in a much larger way because the world's changing so much but everyone else needs to hear these types of things and understand like oh yeah maybe that i do need some of that oh gosh and thanks for <laughs> giving me giving me this insight so in, in terms of writing there was one other thing i wanted to ask you about which i saw just like looking at your website and stuff that i've i've actually been fooling around with lately and that is journaling so i didn't know mm-hmm. that this would come up but you're saying that you've been writing and and really into that communication for a while. Is jur- has journaling been part of that, or how do you think about journaling? Because for me, it's more kind of a um, I'm experimenting with it a little bit, kind of as maybe a different type of meditation or something almost. Mm-hmm. But what's your yeah. experience of it? Because I noticed that's something that you maybe teach or work with people using. Hundred um, percent journaling is incredible. I've I've been journaling for years. Um, it's it hasn't always been the same way, but for a large majority of it, I've used the five minute journal, which is by a company called intelligent change. They have three prompts in the morning and then two prompts at night. So you just take about five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, you write down um, three things you're grateful for in the morning. You write Mm -hmm. down three things that are going to make the day great. And then you write down two affirmations. And then at night, three things that that went amazing that day, and then two things that could have made the day even better. So you're framing your mind every single day to, one, be grateful, to have a positive frame as well. Because even Mm -hmm. the very last question, which is essentially, what could I have done better? It's actually framed 
as um, what you know what could have made the day even better instead of what did you do wrong, right? Like you're right, always right, right. focusing on the language that you use. This goes back to communication too. It's like right. all the language you use, the way that you communicate, the way that you talk to yourself as well as other people is just as important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So journaling for me, yeah, has been a very consistent, easy, short way to create a lot of impact. Like if you look at the if you look at the amount of impact for the the amount of time spent, mm-hmm. the journaling is incredibly useful in my opinion. Same with meditation. It's like I meditate five, ten minutes a day and if I don't, I feel it. Like I yeah. legitimately feel it. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same thing with journaling. If I if I haven't done my journal that day, um I, I do since it has become such an ingrained habit. I do kind of get that that weird feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It's it's. I think it's for me. It, I, I'm just starting with it, so I don't I don't have that much experience with it. But it's it's another. At least the way I'm thinking about it now is kind of just similar to meditation, but it's a different. It gets at different things, or it gets it into your body more because it's a more of an active thing to do. Is just to sit down and write consciously, mm-hmm. and you have to like write something on the page. And um, what I found, especially with meditation we'll see how the journaling goes is that it settles you down, focuses you kind of centers you. But for me, it, it allows me to make better decisions during the day. Like, cause you're reminding yourself who you are or what you want to be or what direction you want to go in. And so then when you're confronted with, you know, the choice to like, you know, have a bad meal or to drink too much or to not exercise or whatever, you just remember like, Oh no, I was going in this direction. And it allows you to just make better decisions. That's kind of a insight that I've gained in the last few years and trying to understand some of this stuff, you know. Does that make sense? It does. And I think the mechanism at work is um, willpower. So hmm. whenever you write something down and you commit something to yourself, for instance, if I'm writing in this journal that, you know, here's the three things I'm going to do today, um, which is one of the prompts. It's like three things that are going to make today great. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go out, go throughout my day, and once I'm presented with the choice of not doing one of those things, I will have already decided that I was going to do it. So I'm taking willpower off the table, and it's many times a day that I can take willpower out of the equation and have a pre-decided destiny figured out. Like right, okay, that is going to increase your your performance results in, in everything that you do. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's a better way to to say it and understand it. Thank you. (laughs) I didn't have the right words for it, but yeah, I was feeling a little bit of that, like, oh, this seems to help me for some reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. It makes total sense. Really cool. Well, Jordan, we've got, uh, I got a few more minutes to, um, for the, for the podcast, but before you get out of here, there's always a few questions I like to, to ask people. And one is about, uh, technology and, and in terms Mm -hmm. of remote work. And now that we've had this pandemic, it's a really, um, interesting question when I hear that I want to hear your answer to about it and that normally uh, you know without a pandemic or whatever uh, you know people sometimes are challenged by technology or you know they really love it or or whatever because it's you know based on their kind of traditional li- living or state of affairs that has been around the world how are you thinking about technology and all these tools now considering this this pandemic has hit, has it changed your mind? Has it reinforced mm-hmm. some things for you or how are you thinking about, about it? I think this pandemic has been the ultimate reinforcement of, of my line of work, right? I don't think you could bat an eye for an instant at the impact that remote work is going to have on our future there's going to be a large subset of companies that never go back to an office. There are some pretty bold claims from remote work experts who I've speak, spoken to who have have basically said that the industry of, of uh, office rental is basically going to go completely under mm. um, because they're just, you know, like co-working spaces right now too that don't have any capacity are going to get sold off. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's just so many things that are happening in the realm of remote work that is enabled by technology. So I see a lot of investment going into companies that are built distributed 
throughout the world. Mm -hmm. They don't have an HQ and a bunch of offices that people are going to. They're distributed organizations. So I see investment going towards those types of companies who are building the technology that allows those types of companies. It's kind of meta, but if you noticed, like the company that has standed to, you know, basically uh, improved uh, one of the most out of any of the companies during this crisis has been Zoom. Because Zoom developed a technology that allowed remote work and virtualized um, communication in such a way that is higher bandwidth than just texting or just having a phone conversation, they have essentially taken up market share. I mean, they've become, I've said this in a couple of my blogs, it's like they have become the Kleenex of video conferencing. <laughs> right, it's yeah. It's like, exactly. it's crazy. Because right. I mean, we're on Skype right now and you could do a Skype call, but sure. I think most people are just saying Zoom now. You want to hop on, on, people are even saying it if they're using Google Hangouts or FaceTime or whatever, they're saying, you know, let's hop on Zoom. And I think, they're adopting the technology of Zoom, but like now it's becoming more of a, a term of video conferencing. So we're going to start to see as well with technology, all these remote tools will start to take, um, there's going to be more competitors uh, down the line, but there's some of these that already have such a big foot share that will become kind of standardized and become more of you know, the, uh, the standard of remote work, for instance. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, I think you're right. Yeah, you're right on. Everybody's like, let's just zoom or whatever, but they really mean WhatsApp or whatever. (laughs) could be another application they're talking about, you know, and in terms of like the, the office rental type of thing, this, this got me thinking, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, just looking at, um, just cause I, you know, I play music and, and this whole like technology thing really hit music maybe 15 years ago when everything started going mp3 nobody sells cds anymore and then like the production part everybody's like well i can produce a record in my bedroom i don't need a big studio and all that kind of stuff but i think this just really hit the big um broadcast network people so like abc nbc and all these like morning shows and stuff where they are um there's you know they're producing shows from their bedroom as if they're running a podcast on you on YouTube, and they realize like, oh, that multi gajillion dollar studio with all these big cameras and lights and all that stuff. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're if you're if you're the business owner running ABC, are are you going back to having that gigantic budget when you realized, oh, I'm doing the show and there was almost no impact on the audience or or anything. I mean, it's yeah. They may have even seen a spike in the audience because right. everybody's home. Because everybody's home, and it's more <laughs> so, interesting to look at or something. Because oh, I see, you know, my favorite TV personality's home. You know, I mean, <laughs> what I it's pretty what wild, I will right? say is is this. This has been really interesting. Is that media and network television, different people that have largely focused on where they are and w- like what they're doing is the show now sporting events as well. Yeah. Now that being decentralized and them having to find new ways to display their content or to uh, come up with an entirely different media campaign. So one of the examples that's interesting is the NBA because what I noticed that the NBA has done is they've now used YouTube to stream games, like mm-hmm. old games, like games from right. 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago that for me – some of those bring up some very interesting childhood memories of right. like how much I love the game. And they're streaming it live on YouTube and I could go watch. And it's such a cool thing where I wouldn't normally go out of my way to go find one of those games. But if I, I'm on right. the YouTube homepage, they're like NBA is streaming Rockets first Blazers playoff game from two years ago when Damian Lillard hit the shot in front of Harden's face. And, right. you know, like all these things where you're just like, oh, my God, I remember that. But I haven't like I haven't seen that in so long, and I can go relive that. So right. I think the companies that are being innovative, even outside of media, but especially right. for media, who are being innovative with how they continue through this to create interesting new pieces of content without being able to go be somewhere, I think that they're the ones who are going to come out of this on the other side with uh, even more loyal fan base. Right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a cool insight. Yeah, because you know they might not have ever done that. If there, if the league wasn't shut down, they might not have ever kind of started streaming in that way. But they're being kind of creative and kind of going to their content library and pretty interesting, right? Yeah, cool. They could just have, yeah, they could just have those games running 
on a on a channel like they could literally create a youtube channel right that's like nba classics and it could just be live streaming all day right all day you know it's probably what's going to come out of this yeah if they don't do that that's they're stupid <laughs> well by team or by demographic i mean think about all the demographic information facebook has all the kind of stuff you could hyper market to like you know a guy that was born in this state, you hyper market to, you know, the championship that was going mm-hmm. on when he was 18 or whatever, you know, um, so that he remembers pretty interesting. Well, you know, thinking about all this stuff, it's sort of like, you know, you got to keep your, your, the plasticity in your mind, you know, kind of this fluidity flow going to kind of be able to adjust and respond. And, and that's, and that's my next question for you is how do you, how do you keep your mind open to all of this change? So, you know, one thing I really like about the Nomad community and finding people like you that are working with, you know, new technologies that are helping people find remote jobs, which is now, you know, more uh, interesting than ever to, to consider that. But how do you keep your own mind open to finding these new things and pivoting and continue to embracing all this change? We're not everyone's, you know, in this in this vein. I, I'll, I'll have to admit it's it's been somewhat natural for me for a long time to do that now now where does that start i'm not 100 percent sure but i will tell you this traveling seeing other parts of the world being exposed to different types of people and cultures has been probably the biggest effect on my ability to adapt because i i spent two years in 15 countries on five continents never less than usually a month in each place Mm -hmm. now for me when i'm spending that much time in in a place you can't help but adapt you don't have a choice you're you're completely out of your element and in in a country where they don't speak your language where you don't know where the grocery store is where you don't i mean it's just every little simple thing is not simple right like if you imagine someone who's lived in their hometown for 50 years and they've gone to the same grocery store, they've gone to the same dentist, they've done like every single small piece of my life has changed so much over the past two years, pretty much every week mm-hmm. to every two weeks that the idea that the whole world wouldn't be changing and adapting more is actually more scary to me. <laughs> it's it's right. it's actually harder to believe I'm sitting in one spot right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like that's harder for me at this point. I so s- I think if if you do need to adopt more of a sense of adaptability and build that within your character and your DNA, it takes really practical but intentional exposure to things that are way outside of your comfort zone. Right, right. Well, um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so this was one of my big things at the beginning of the year. I, I put out my top 10 ways I'm reinventing myself for 2020. Uh, and travel's always been a big, big part of it because it's sort of like maybe, maybe it's the lazy man's way out in a way because the fact that you're traveling where all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I went to a new city and everything is new, whatever. It's sort of like in, in a way, like I don't have to like go out there and take a course and be so active about it. The, the passive way in a way of traveling gets you those new inputs, whether you want to experience them or not. You're sort of forcing <laughs> forcing the issue for yourself, right? And, and it's so, uh, I guess, invigorating and to me exciting and interesting and does put your mind in that more open and adaptive state. And you said the right word, adapt. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's who is, you know, that, that's who survives in the end. The people that are most adaptable, not the strongest, not the brightest, um, it's the people that can, you know, readily adapt the quickest and the easiest. So pretty interesting. Well, you know, and Jim, I, I would challenge you. I would actually challenge you on one that? thing you said, okay, which is that that's the lazy man's way out because immersion is a different strategy. It's not, it's not lazier by any means. And I think it's actually more active and more proactive. I'll give you one example. If you're, looking to learn Spanish. Is it lazier for you to take an online course or to move to Mexico? Uh, well, certainly, yeah. Uh, is Moving to Mexico is a bigger commitment. And you know what? I, I think you're right. I totally agree with you. I, I was kind of saying that about myself, I guess, probably with my own bias of thinking like, um, you know, because traveling is hard. Like people don't understand that, I guess. Like I've traveled a bunch now and people think it, 
that you're on vacation or whatever. It's like it, it takes a, a quite amount of effort to go through customs, to pack and do all, you know, to plan, do the do the planning, all that kind of stuff. I, that's not what I meant, I guess. I guess I was just thinking like it's more readily once you're there, once you're immersed mm-hmm. that you get those in points, but but point taken. You are correct. I <laughs> I just don't want you to not give yourself credit because I think what you've done is you've basically said the easier way for me to actually absorb this. It's more of like how you're taking the dosage. It's not, are you taking enough of the dosage? It's like, what's going to be the most effective way for me to, uh, to do this. And you've determined that the actual travel and hands on some, some people may learn more about things in a textbook, but I tell you what, yeah. from my experience in life, that's not been the case for me. It, I, I've learned 10 times more being in something where I'm immersed rather than pulling up a YouTube video and watching something about it. Right, right. Yeah, I, I agree too. Yeah, travel's, travel's an amazing thing to just, it Im- impacts you in so many different ways. It's hard to. You know, it's hard to describe, really. I mean, you learn you learn a lot about the world. You see things differently. I mean, for me, I, I love it because it's just it's fun, and I get to meet a bunch of different people. But it keeps my mind in this adaptive state and informs me about investing and technologies, things that I like to learn about. So, really cool. Well, you know, I've got one final uh, question for you, and this is something that's been on my mind lately with you know this whole change with the pandemic, and that is, what are you feeling urgent about? Or, or maybe anxiety about. Maybe you can interpret that either way mm. these days. I think urgency-wise is getting out a version of my education that's accessible to more people. Um, for for quite a bit of the time that I've been doing this, I've had a uh, you know a, a coaching program that I deliver over the course of eight weeks. That's very personal. There's digital learning. There's one to one and group learning. There's all these different things that I incorporate. But there's a lot of people who can't afford that mm-hmm. um, because it is a higher end premium service. And there are a lot of people who could just use more of a uh, not only an introductory level education about this, but a self paced ability to access the education that that I have. Mm -hmm. So my urgency, especially the past month or so, has been recreating messaging, and this goes back to writing and why writing is so important, basically recreating the the, uh, the messaging for my course Mm -hmm. and then creating it at a price point where I can feel good about it going out as well as people can feel good about investing in it and this is the whole dance of pricing strategy is Mm -hmm. is one that i don't ever envy anyone being in the position to do it's not always Mm -hmm. like price testing and and talking to to clients about what they're willing to pay and like figuring out what you're okay with it's just a it's a really hard thing to do so i'm looking forward to getting this this out my education out to more people and i realize we haven't talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of that. Mm-hmm. So the one thing I'd want to you know leave with your audience is I, all of my free resources. I have you know various different web trainings and and uh, checklists and videos and all sorts of things that they can go through that will help them kind of get started. Mm-hmm. And then you know as you as you kind of figure out what it is that you really want to do and you have a sense of the transferable skills and you know you you kind of bite off a little bit more than than uh, uh, you want some more, then that's when you can kind of move up to uh, more education about what this is like. I so see. my urgency is is getting that out to people as soon as as possible because they need it right now. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. So if you're out there like spinning, I can't remember what the word that you used earlier, where you're you know in the in that spot where you know you need to reach out and do something differently. I mean, maybe now is the time to do it. If if people are interested in, in finding out more information about what you're talking about or, or just connecting with you or just kind of uh, watching your travels or whatever, where, where would they find you? Where, where, would you, where would you send them? Yeah, theremotejobcoach.com. Okay. So theremotejobcoach.com is one place that can be pretty, that's pretty centralized. It's got all of my remote um, job materials and stuff there that you can uh, link out to and 
free stuff. Um, JordanSCarroll.com with two R's, two L's is my, my personal site as well. So between those two, you can find everything you'd ever hope to find about me. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. There's a lot. There's quite a bit out there too. So. Sounds good, man. It sounds good. Um, yeah. So go check that out. That will, all those, all that information will be in the show notes. So you can click on the links if you're listening and look for those in the show notes. Um, okay. So one quick real final question, which I don't normally ask, but because you're, everybody's hunkered down now and you're stuck in Playa, not stuck there, but just, you know, you, you've decided mm-hmm. to stay there. Where would you travel first? Once the travel bans and the stay at home orders are lifted and people are traveling more commonly, where do you think you might want to visit or have a change of pace uh, at soon? Mm. Well, I'll just say this. I have a plan to take a trip with my parents in August. Uh, it's a trip that we had done since I was a kid to mm. Pismo Beach, California. Oh, okay. And we have not done that as a family for at least a few years at this point. So my desire is that that trip goes uh, goes to plan. I see. So Very cool. Well, I think by then... Hopefully things will be opened back up and uh, we can let's hope so, travel <laughs> safely. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, at least wear your mask or whatever, whatever you go. Keep washing your hands out there, people. So <laughs> anyways, well, Jordan, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I'll connect with you again soon somewhere in the world. Yeah, Jim, sounds good. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. Great questions and enjoy the conversation. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, Join our mailing list at jimjimsreinventionrevolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries. If you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked, or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it, and will help others find the same value that you found.